The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Very early when the sun had risen on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb. They were saying to one another, Who will roll back the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. On entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a white robe, and they were utterly amazed. He said to them, Do not be amazed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter, He is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him as he told you. The Gospel of the Lord. If this is your first Easter vigil, you might wonder why we're doing all the standing and sitting. Uh, after each reading, we have a responsorial psalm, and then we stand for the opening prayer, and then we sit right back down again and for another reading, and we repeat that half a dozen times. And then we finally stand up for the Gloria, which is totally out of place uh, compared to a normal Catholic Mass, but it seems like at the Gloria we're back on track. We sing the opening prayer. But then we sit back down for another reading, and... Um, this one is the first reading of the New Testament, and it seems that some order has been restored at this point. And then after the New Testament reading, we have the triple intonation of the Alleluia, and of course, the Easter Gospel. There's a reason that the liturgy is like this, with all the stops and starts, with all the standing and sitting. We make progress, and it seems like we bring that progress to a halt. The liturgy of the Easter Vigil is meant to mirror salvation history. It's meant to mirror God's plan to save us. If you paid attention to the readings, all nine of them, all throughout God's plan, there are plenty of false starts, plenty of problems along the way. Reading through the Bible, you're faced with the reality that we we really kept messing things up over and over, and it seemed that every time we took one step forward, we could only take two steps back. From creation, we fall to the original sin. So fallen were we that God started over with Noah, which led us to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if you know anything about them, their lives are anything but straightforward. One step forward, two steps back. At the betrayal of Joseph by his brothers, the Israelites find themselves in Egypt as slaves for 400 years. And as we just heard, they escaped triumphantly through the Red Sea. But due to their lack of faith, They spent 40 years waiting in the desert to finally have the courage to enter into the promised land. One step forward, two steps back. After settling the land, the Israelites rejected God as their king and begged for an earthly one. And after the reigns of Saul and David and Solomon, civil war tore the kingdom apart. Israel was crushed by the Assyrians, completely destroyed by the Babylonians. Once again, Israel fled back to Egypt. They were taken captive to Babylon. And after returning to the promised land 70 years later, they were persecuted by the Greeks. But for a time, they won their independence. However, eventually they found themselves under the dominion of the Romans. One step forward, two steps back. And Jesus was born into that chaos. Jesus was born into a chaotic and crazy world with a long history of chaos and craziness. And and so the liturgy of the Easter Vigil reflects that. I want you to to keep that theme of craziness and chaos in your mind for the rest of this talk. I want you to imagine what the resurrection must have been like. Sure, we know, we all know the story, but I think we know it, it too well. It's too familiar to us. It has become a fairly standard Bible story. Perhaps we see the event of the resurrection from a 2,000-year experience perspective, and we know how things turn out. Jesus died so that we could be saved, and he rose that we might have eternal life. 
But let's take a break from that preconceived sort of black and white catechism notion of the resurrection. And instead, I want you to place yourself in the actual scene of the resurrection. Close your eyes and imagine it. Perhaps you're one of the group that goes to Jesus' tomb in the morning of Easter. Or maybe you're one of the apostles who stayed behind in the upper room. It's early in the morning. It's dark. You're going back to the scene of the worst crime in history. We killed God. And not only did we kill him, we humiliated him. We tortured him. And so you go, still in complete shock from the day before, how did this happen? It fell apart so quickly. But you're going to give Jesus the dignified burial that he deserves to finish the burial process according to the law of Moses. And all the while, in the back of your head, you're thinking, how in the world are we going to get into the tomb? Surely there'll be somebody to help. Maybe one of the soldiers. In a rush of confusion, you think, well, I guess we'll figure it out when we get there. And you continue on. But are you even in the right place? This can't be his tomb. It's open. How can that possibly be? We have to be in the wrong place, right? Please tell me we're in the wrong place. This is his tomb, but where is he? What, what did they do to him? How dare they? But Pilate's soldiers were supposed to be stationed here. Where are they? They were supposed to prevent anyone from tampering with his body. The, the chief priests were so paranoid that someone would steal his body and pretend that he was still alive. What in the world is going on? And then there's the angel. What would that have been like? The Bible only says, they saw a man in dazzling white and they were utterly amazed. Utterly amazed. I have a friend, Grace. She's one of these people. There's still people like this to this day, uh, like, say, Padre Pio or St. John Vianney. She can actually see saints around her in her day-to-day -day life. She doesn't see them all the time, but they are always there. And she says that the angels are the most impressive of all the saints in terms of their size and their beauty. Regardless, these women would have had their world turned upside down from one emotional extreme to the next, to fear, to rage, to confusion, and now they're allowed to feel joy for the first time in a couple of days. And with a newfound hope, they run back to tell the others in the upper room, to tell them what the angel had said. They're not going to believe this. Now, imagine that you're one of the 12. You literally left Jesus out to dry. You left him to die on a cross. You denied even having known him. How can you possibly even call yourself his friend? You're filled with shame. Your heart is broken. It all happened so fast. Your head is a spinning mess of confusion. Nobody's seen Judas in a couple of days since that night in the garden. Thomas isn't there either. Just ten men in the upper room. And you're listening to every sound outside that locked door. Any minute, the next knock on that door could be one of Pilate's thugs, or maybe even the high priest guard, come to arrest you. Come to give you the same sentence they came to Jesus. And who knows what would happen if someone did come knocking? Would they offer any kind of mercy? If given the chance, would I just deny Jesus again under that kind of pressure? Would I scatter from the group and never preach the gospel again? I don't know, because when I was put to the test in front of Jesus, I failed. What makes me think I would do any better now that Jesus was gone? You don't trust yourself. How could you trust yourself? How could you leave him after all he did, after all he said? How could this happen? After all he did, after all he said, was it all a lie? Was none of it real? 
Did it all mean nothing? Am I a fool for following him? Was it even worth it? Was it worth it for me to leave everything behind and follow this guy? How could I possibly go back now? God, why did you let this happen? I saw miracles. They changed me. I gave my life to you and left everything behind, and this is what I get in return. Fighting through tears of self-hatred, and then tears of sadness, and then tears of rage, there's a knock on the door. Here it is. This is how it ends. You know what? I don't even care. I'll get what I deserve. But it's the women. Back from the tomb already. What? That didn't take long. Something must have gone wrong. He wasn't there. What did they do to him? Where did they take him? Is nothing sacred? Humiliating him? Murdering him? Wasn't enough? And now you have to desecrate his body? What do you mean you saw an angel? What is happening? How is this possible? Is it possible? It sounds way too good to be true. Maybe these women are just getting their hopes up. And believe it or not, that is where Easter Sunday leaves us. Jesus does not say a word in our gospel. Jesus does not appear once in the gospel that we just heard. He's missing. And he leaves us with a lot of questions. Where is he? What's going on? What does this mean that he's alive? How could this be? If we didn't know the end to the story, you would think that the church is a little crazy for leaving Easter on such a cliffhanger. If it's supposed to be about the resurrection, why don't we hear all the details? We, we tend to think of things quite simply. Jesus rose from the dead, and he saved us from sin. But there is so much more to it. Thousands of years of history, all the way back to the beginning of creation, and most of that history is one of craziness and chaos, of sin and mistakes. And I think it would be a mistake to miss that aspect of Easter. Because the incredible thing about it, the incredible thing about all that chaos and craziness is that chaos and craziness cannot stop God. He works around it. He works through it. And he works because of it. God brings the divine into the messy every day. God brings the divine into our mixed, often conflicting emotions, into your anger, into your sadness, into your loneliness. God brings the divine into our darkness and our own confusion. So don't hide that part of your life from him. When you talk to him, bring it all to him, especially the unpleasant parts that you would rather not talk about. Our salvation was not a squeaky clean affair. It was a winding, twisting, very human road with all of the imperfections that come with humanity. But he wants all of it. If we do fast forward to the end of the story, the first words of the resurrection, Jesus sees his apostles and he says, peace be with you. Jesus is not afraid of the messiness or the chaos of this world. He came to this world to redeem that chaos and that messiness. Jesus sees your soul with all of its flaws and he cuts right through it all with the first words of Easter. Peace be with you. Hallelujah.